today. Um, we are letting our participants in today. So welcome, welcome to everybody that's joining us this morning. It's an absolute pleasure to have you with us and we're going to have a fantastic time. Today we have a thrill of a talk and um, you're going to be blown away by the amazing discussions that will be happening. So as you're joining us right now, please uh, drop a comment below. Let us know where you're connecting with us from. We wanna know where you are around the country or if you're outside the country, please let us know just on the comment section below. Tell us, yay, I'm in Cape Town or tell us uh, something. Let me see. Ah, we've got Somerset West in the house. We've got Josie in the house. We've got so many people. Um, Megan's gonna be a cool, it's gonna be a cool one. Welcome, welcome everybody. I think um, in the next 30 seconds, we'll be able to kickstart the show. Uh, thank you to all the participants that are joining us this morning. It's absolutely fantastic. The room, is, the room is filling up. We've got Hillcrest KZN in the house. Hello, KZN. How's Devin doing this morning? Um, we've got Josie in the house. We've got Pretoria. I hope everybody enjoys this paying their ethos this morning, Megan. What do you think? <laughs> I hope not. Then, I hope everybody's <laughs> put down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got um, uh, we've got uh, the uh, we've got a team in the UK um, wow. that are currently stuck in England, uh, but they're from Hot Bay. So Lisa, Lisa, uh, I think it's Lisa Day. Uh, welcome, welcome to you this morning. Fantastic. Oh, and the comments are just keep coming on, keep coming on. We've got Constantia in Cape Town. That's our sister, uh, our sister, just uh, Steph, uh, who's in Constantia, very close to Kistenbosch. So Steph, we look forward to welcoming you to Kistenbosch uh, soon. Uh, bring your picnic basket. We open to the public, uh, as you know, seven days a week. Um, and we've got Josie. Welcome, everybody. Um, I think it's safe to say we can just... Um, start with the uh, with the formal introductions uh, i see a lot of us are in and um, thank you everybody thank you uh, jenny um and colin for joining us this morning thank you peter from jersey um thank you uh, we've got so many people here oh it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a crack of the morning now um ladies and gentlemen welcome once again uh, to our virtual wednesday talk it's an absolute pleasure to have you guys. We do this every second Wednesday and it just, it just blows us all away. Um, we've been having fantastic speakers and today it is no exception. We've got um, Megan Parker with us this morning who's going to tell us about the beautiful trees. Um, but before we kick start, let's uh, just a little bit of some um, house rules. Uh, please keep those comments going. That is one of the most important house rules we have this morning. Um, leave your comments as the chat is going by. Let us know what your thinking is. Um, this particular talk is also live on Facebook. Uh, we will be sharing it on our strict Nature Facebook page as well as our Kistenbosch Facebook page. So please go on on our social media platforms and like this talk and also leave a comment right there. Um, we will be taking questions and answers. Um, after Megan has given us the wonderful talk. And we also have a fantastic surprise for you at the end, uh, which we'll tell you in more detail after Megan's talk. Now, Megan, without any waste of time, let's jump into it. And um, once again, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're hoping that everybody is safe uh, and sound wherever you are. And um, we're really privileged and honored to have you with us. And Megan, same to you, it's such an honor to you, to to e meet you, uh, I can't wait to meet you live. Um, your work is absolutely amazing, and um, it's such an absolute honor to have you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Megan Parker has a degree in conservation and a master's in environmental management. Uh, these, along with her years of guiding and training field guides, uh, give a solid grounding in all topics natural. She was senior producer on the SABC environmental TV program. You remember that program, the 5050? For nearly a decade and has authored a range of books, including the best selling Game Ranger in your backpack. Megan is a fantastic human being. She is a proud mother of two. 
She is a loving wife. She is an enthusiast and naturalist like most of us here this morning. So today she'll be sharing with us about the wonderful topic of trees, if trees could talk. Megan, without any waste of time, over to you. Wonderful, thank you, John. And thank you for such a, a lovely introduction. I actually feel like you were the main event. I mean, how do I, how do I follow on from that enthusiastic? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you'll be fine. <laughs> Go for it. Just have fun with it. <laughs> this world has changed so much to be able to be doing all of this online. Um, I have to say I'd, I'd much rather be physically in the gardens. Kirstenbosch is honestly one of my favorite places in this country. And uh, both for the trees and, and just being immersed in yeah, I mean, it's almost like a spiritual cathedral, isn't it, that garden? Um, and for the scones and cream, best scones and cream in the country. So uh, there you have it. <laughs> Lovely to be in the company of fellow tree lovers and Kirsten Bosch lovers, uh, to be with kindred spirits this morning. So welcome, everybody. Um, and if trees could talk, what is it that they would say? And I know it's tradition that generally you don't give the answer to a question, if you pose a question in a presentation, you usually wait till the end of the presentation to give the answer. But I like to give my answer to what, if trees could talk, what would they say right up front? Because this is the grounding um, of, of why I love trees and why I am a tree enthusiast. And basically, I think that if trees could talk, they would tell us that they have been utterly underrated. That if you think about it, trees are so fundamental to life on earth, well, all plants, but trees in particular, they give us so much. They provide shade. Um, they are the perfect place to have a picnic. They give us oxygen to breathe. They make jungle gyms for our children to play in. They give us food, fruit, beautiful, um, delicious things to eat. They are medicinal. Uh, there's just so much uh, that trees do for us. And yet so often we don't stop to notice them, particularly for us bush lovers that love to go off to the bush to the Kruger or to areas sort of more in the Northwest of the country. Um, which very broadly speaking is um, how I define bush felt in my book. Um, people just forget to notice the trees. And I think we do ourselves a disservice by that because I think uh, trees just add such a layer to um, our understanding of the bush and our experience of the bush. More than anything, trees are just fun. I just find that I love being amongst trees. And some of my most amazing memories have trees as the backdrop to them. So if I go back and I think of my bush stories and, and my favorite um, memories from the bush and experiences in the bush, there's always a tree that features in that story somewhere. And I think that this is probably where my passion for trees first grew. And by way of example, I just want to show you this photo. It's not a particularly remarkable photo. This was taken up in the Makuleki section of the Kruger Park in the Pafuri region. And I'm sitting on a termite mound here under a tree. I think it was a jacket plum, although the bark is, is so far out of the picture, I can't actually um, tell anymore. This was taken about, sure, 15, 20 years ago. And um, maybe not as long as 20. Um, I'm watching some buffalo in the background there in the sort of middle back of the photograph. And it gets exceptionally hot up at Makuleki. Um, I was with a group of students that I was training at the time and we'd been for a walk in the fever tree forests. And as we emerged, there was this herd of buffalo. And obviously one doesn't want to be caught out in the open in the middle of nowhere with a herd of buffalo, especially with lots of lala palm scrub around. You just never know what's hiding behind the lala palms. Um, and in this heat, this sort of 40 something degree heat on that particular morning, um, we made the decision to retreat into the shade of this very scrawny little jacket plum and hide out on the relative high ground of this termite mound. And as we sat there, hidden from the buffalo because we were in the shade and hidden from the elements, we were able to sit and just be quiet and, and wait for those buffalo to come into that open area just in front of my knees there. And that they did, this whole herd came out. Uh, we were able to watch them. They were undisturbed, the best way to watch wildlife um, and then moved off. And we just had such a memorable sighting of these, these big bovids on foot. 
And the truth of the matter is, we wouldn't have been able to have the sighting at all if it hadn't been for the tree, because it was screening us from this heat and also providing the cover that we needed in order to enjoy secrecy. And this is what I mean when I say that trees are, first of all, in the background of my memories, but second of all, that they, they are so important and they, they add such an element to our stories, even if we are not uh, particularly tree enthusiasts or noticing them there, they are fulfilling a role. Before I carry on, I do just want to add the disclaimer that I am not a botanical expert. I did study um, botany, obviously, as part of my conservation degree and my master's in environmental management, and I love trees, but I am not a, a botanist. Um, I am what I call a tree enthusiast. And obviously from training guides and, and lay people for the best part of my adult career, I've just developed a, a knack, I suppose, for being able to dumb down some of this information and make it more accessible to people because I think trees are quite difficult to get your head around, but they don't need to be. Um, and this was really the reason that I um, designed my, my layman's method, which I then um, captured in 100 bushveld trees. Um, the, the, the system is not based on science. As I said, it is simply based on trying to make information accessible to normal humans. So please forgive me. I'm sure there's a lot of people on this, this um, webinar that probably know a lot more about trees than I do. Um, but I'm here really just to share my passion and to share some of the information in a simple way to, to make it accessible to as many people um, as possible, because I really feel that a little bit of information um, drives a curiosity to learn a little bit more. And the more we know about something, the more we're inspired to care about it. So very broadly speaking, the book is, is pretty much based around these six groups uh, lumped together by very, very obvious features. So the giants, which are obviously those large iconic trees out there, um, simple leaf trees, compound leaf trees, uh, trees that have got spines and thorns, trees that have very different growth forms, and then sort of more shrubby trees that don't really fit into any of these categories. I'm not going to go into these in depth, except to say that today I'm probably going to talk mostly about the group, the giants. As part of this um, process of teaching people, I developed this mnemonic, which I'd like to share with you briefly, because the talk did promise a little bit on um, demystifying how to identify trees, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. It is all in the book. So if it, it piques your interest and you, you wanting to get into trees a little bit, then this is my method in quick overview of how to do that. And basically I take with me an imaginary tree identification friend when I go out there by the name of Samson. Samson B. Fish is his name. And this is really a mnemonic that summarizes very simply how one can identify trees, starting with the leaves, which is the Samson part, and then different elements of the tree. And if you can just remember this and work through the different elements that each of these letters stand for, then it, it does become a little bit less tricky when you're looking at a tree and you're kind of going like, oh, where do I even start? It's always a good idea if you are out there and unsure of what tree you're looking at to just pick a sample uh, to take home to help you identify the tree at a later stage. Just make sure that you pick a big enough one, not just one little leaflet. It's always a good idea to take a little branch with you. So briefly, the Samson part refers to whether the leaf is simple or compound, what its arrangement on the stem is. Is it are the leaves arranged opposite or in whorls, that kind of thing? What do the margins or the edges of the leaf look like? Does the leaf have a particular size? What sort of shape does it take? Um, is there a smell or a texture? Um, things like veins, um, are, are they giving the leaf uh, defining characteristics? You can see the veins on this Mopani leaf stick out quite a lot and the fountain shape of the leaf is very diagnostic of those sorry of those veins on the leaf and the butterfly shape and then are there nodes or glands and that then covers the different aspects of the leaf that you can look for. Bark is a wonderful way of being able to identify a tree at, at a glance. That um, jacket plum I just referred to that I was sitting underneath, the, the third 
um, image on the top with those dark bits against a white background that look like roof tiles that are peeling off a roof, that's a jacket plum's bark. And just at a single glance, you're able to see, oh, that's a jacket plum. The first picture there is the leadwood's bark, very pale um, with patches, almost like the scales of a crocodile, um, that make it very easy to recognize. Some trees, like neola trees, have their leaves growing directly out of the bark, and, and that will tell you immediately what kind of tree it is, if its enormous size doesn't give it away first. Fruit and flowers, lovely, easy way to identify plants, but sadly, they don't always have their fruit and flowers on them. These are usually restricted to very specific times of the year, but when they are, they're a great way to help you identify the tree. Um, size, shape, growth form, what does the tree look like at a glance? Spines and thorns, um, other protrusions like galls that insects may make on, on the tree. Um, and then the habitat and distribution where the tree is growing is often a wonderful way of working out what um, potential species it could be. So very, I know that was a bit of a speed lesson, but very briefly, that is the Samson B fish mnemonic um, that I apply to, to just being able to figure out what tree things are. And I summarize that into my 100 Bushveld Trees, which, as I said, was very much a book that was written for the lay person. It's written in English, uh, not botanese, as I like to call it, just trying to define features in very, very simple ways. Um, we looked, myself and, and the photographer Shem Campion, at 100 we took a scoop of a hundred of the most common trees that you're likely to find out there um, when you're um, driving around the, the Kruger or in other bushveld areas. And then um, each page is really just um, a summary of the features, but depicted very much in a photographic form. So that almost at a glance without even reading the English text, you're able to see immediately the defining characteristics of the, the tree. And if those elements don't work for you, then uh, refer to the quick ID there on the left hand side, which really just um, categorizes in, in one sentence the, the feature that you're looking for. And um, as I, I've just mentioned the bark there, you can see I say the bark appears daubed with shades of gray paint with peeling old bark resembling black tiles or a brick wall where the plaster has peeled. So that gives you an idea of the, of the kind of, of methods and um, approach that was taken with this book. But without further ado, let's get on to learning something about these amazing trees. Um, and trees obviously are not only part of our stories, but also very much a part of the ecological story. Um, they are not only habitats, um, but, but play a huge role ecologically in supporting different species um, and just forming part of that uh, food chain and, and the, the cycle of life. But where does one begin? Honestly, um, even with a hundred bushveld trees, where do you start? And I suppose with um, the bush, generally, if you, you're new to Africa or you're new to the bush, where do you start with mammals? The obvious place to start would be with um, the big five. And so that is what I have determined to do today is to really just start with the big five of trees. If one had to close your eyes and think, what are those five iconic bushveld trees out there? This would be my selection of them. Um, this one that you're looking at right now is the Nyala tree. Um, and just really, I popped this picture in again to, to reinforce that idea of them being backdrops both to the ecology and to our bush stories. Um, my husband and I, as soon as lockdown um, was released and we were able to get to Kruger, we popped off to the Punda Maria area of Kruger that had some rain at the beginning of October. It was beautiful and green. And we just love that part of the park. We love these enormous trees and we were driving the Mpongol um, loop south of Sereni the one day, just enjoying um, being in that cathedral of trees along the river. And we stopped to admire this tree, which isn't even on the river. It's on the other side of the road. 
And lo and behold, while we were admiring the tree, my husband noticed that there was in fact a leopard lying in it. And how is that for the perfect place for a leopard to lie, except nine times out of 10, they're just simply not lying on that branch where we hope they will be. Um, so, so just another reiteration that when we take time to appreciate things like trees, often the big five just come to us. So number one on the list, of course, is the baobab. And the baobab really needs very little introduction. Um, this is a tree I think we all know, but it is, it's the stalwart and the icon of the African bush, particularly the drier areas like um, the Pafuri region. Um, Adansonia digitata is its Latin name for those of you who enjoy knowing that. And the legend goes that these trees were planted upside down because once they have lost their leaves, they look like they have been put on their heads and have their roots sticking out. And it is believed that it was the naughty hyena who perpetuated this state of affairs because at the beginning when God was handing out the seeds for all the trees, he had given them to the animals to go and plant and the hyena was last in line and he got the last batch, which were the, the baobab seeds. And he was so put out for being left to last that he planted his seeds upside down um, or so the story goes. But in fact, a baobab is not planted upside down. It, it does of course develop a beautiful, rich leafy canopy. And um, that canopy supports all manner of life and creatures in it. Um, the, the leaves are very easy to um, identify if one can see them, but inevitably they're well out of, um, out of reach. They are what we call digitally compound, palmately compound, and clustered together at the ends of, of branches. Um, but interestingly, have a simple leaf structure and they're not compound when they're younger. So that can make identifying young baobabs a little bit tricky. But of course, one doesn't really need the leaves to identify a baobab um, because those enormous um, marshmallow-like, molten lava-like um, trunks are just so, so obvious. And it's quite remarkable if one thinks that such enormous trees that can live for apparently 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 years are actually made up of 40% water. The bark is incredibly water rich. It's very fibrous. So um, elephants easily peel away sections of the bark and the um, they completely ruin the, the appearance of the tree. They give it this very um, warped, look um, and um, people also use the fiber and they will come and harvest fiber to weave ropes and all of that kind of thing, fishing nets um, from, from the bark of a um, baobab tree. But remarkably, these enormous trunks that can stand for so long, when they do eventually die, they literally crumble into a pile of mulch like this. And this tree hadn't fallen over long before I, I took this photograph, but because there's no heartwood, essentially, um, the, the tree disintegrates and deteriorates very quickly, um, obviously forming part of that cycle, that nature's cycle of life and refertilizing the ground um, with its enormous bulk. But the one thing about baobabs is that they are able to heal. So even though the elephants ransack them um, and you know, in, in the past where people have lived around them, they've often damaged them in one way or another. But like Barilla trees, baobabs are, are a tree that can actually cover over in time and continue to grow. But what does tend to happen, again, also from the, the, the fibrous tissue, is that they do become very, very hollow. Um, and if a fire or something comes along, um, it also further um, hollows out those areas where they are damaged because they have no, no protection against it. Um, and in the end, you end up with these um, sometimes entirely hollow trees. So only the outside of that enormous tree then is holding up that enormous canopy. And these have been used for all manner of, of things by people, grain um, storage areas, um, as houses. Later on in time, people have put bars and, and hospitals and things like that inside the trees. Um, 
people would shelter in them. And of course, animals shelter in them. Also, um, water will collect in these cavities and in dry times, it is a place where uh, small arboreal animals like genets would be able to drink and to find water. Um, I remarkably, um, the very, very first time that I saw a baobab was in the Luangwa Valley. And um, I went inside this tree, the whole tree had kind of created a doorway and looked up inside and there was an entire colony of bats living inside the tree. So, so there's a, another example of how smaller creatures um, monopolize these trees as ecosystems. Um, bees also love to, to utilize the, the holes in baobabs um, and, and it becomes an important habitat uh, for those honey making creatures which then of course service um, animals like honey badgers or honey guides or, or us humans. The flower of the baobab is wonderfully unique. And although I mentioned seeing those bats inside the, the baobab tree in Luangwa, um, the, the they weren't straw colored tree, uh, straw colored fruit bats, which is the bat that fertilizes this tree um, or pollinates, I should say. And this powder brush structure in the flower is perfectly designed. Uh, the flower smells like meat, uh, like carrion, it attracts the bats that then become dusted in the pollen and as they fly from flower to flower which are only on the tree for 24 hours so there's a degree of urgency about it and um, as the bats fly from flower to flower they then become covered in the pollen and they transfer it and that is how the tree is uh, pollinated and then develops into these very wonderfully unique fruit, uh, very hard woody shells. They're probably the size of two gem squash melted together with a lovely velvety um, coat. And then those pips in the pith are covered in cream of tartar. Uh, in Afrikaans, the tree is called a crema tart boom. And um, these can be sucked to relieve thirst. Um, the, the, Seeds can also be pounded down to um, make a porridge and a coffee um, and all have wonderful health benefits because of that, that cream of tartar. And that then brings us onto the next tree that also has very unique fruit, um, but larger in this case than even the baobab, the sausage tree. And this is just one of my absolute favorite trees in Africa, mostly because they tend to just grow in such beautiful places, always on, on lovely riverine stretches. Um, this one is growing in the Luangwa Valley in Zambia. And these trees, I suppose, are the butcher shop windows of the, of the bush felt. They, they literally look like those old fashioned butcher shops um, where you've got strings of sausages hanging down on display, the Kigilia Africana. But not a good place to have a picnic. I mentioned earlier using the shade of trees to picnic, because if one of these um, up to 10 kilogram uh, heavy pods lands on your head, um, it's going to, to bring a, an abrupt end to your picnic. Um, and parking your car under the tree is also probably not recommended. Um, these are um, very hard fruit, uh, they're poisonous while they're green, um, and really not utilized hugely by humans. It might look like a butcher shop, um, the tree, when they're covered in fruit, but not a good plan to harvest them and eat them. Um, the, the fruit grow on these very, very long stems. They can reach up to a meter in, in length. simply because of the structure of the flowers, these lovely downward facing um, bright red flowers that interestingly, like the baobab, are, are pollinated by bats. Again, you can see the um, sort of facing outwards so that any little furry creature coming to visit that flower is going to become entirely covered in that pollen and, and transfer it from tree to tree. Um, but each of these flowers, these candelabra-like flowers would then develop into one of these sausages. Um, a spectacular tree when it is fruiting and in flower because often it does this just as it's getting its new leaves. So it, it really does become quite an interesting sight. 
And those leaves, for those interested, um, are, are interesting in themselves in that they are compound, imperipenate compound, meaning it's got a terminal leaflet at the end of the leaf. Um, but because the leaflets are quite large, they, they for an amateur, they would look at that and go, well, you know, the, that doesn't look like a compound leaf to me. Each of those leaflets are quite large. Um, but you will, you will know or you will learn from Bushveld trees that a compound leaf, it all depends where the axillary bud is. There's a little bud that joins where the, the petiole of a leaf joins onto the twig of a leaf. And that would be right at the base of these shiny green leaves that become darker with age um, and are quite leathery to the touch. Um, just a quick um, segue to the bark, which is fairly nondescript, uh, quite smooth though, comparatively to some of the other bushveld trees. And those enormous main trunks on the trees are always very conical, very round, cylindrical, I should say, um, and, and upright and start with this big dark green canopy. Just to come back to the fruits for a second, uh, these fruits are used for um, huge amounts of, of human uses, if not for food. Um, they're used for treatments for syphilis, uh, rheumatism, skin ulcerations, acne, stomach troubles in children. Um, they've been used for lactation problems. Um, also, there are rumors of them being used in genital enlargement ceremonies. So interesting uh, uh, correlations there. Uh, they're believed to deter whirlwinds and babies are sometimes rubbed with the powdered fruit to um, stimulate vigor and health in the babies. But more importantly, um, while for many years it was believed that these fruits weren't eaten by anything, they are in fact eaten by many different species. So uh, even giraffe and zebra will nibble on these, uh, squirrels, um, arboreal creatures, monkeys and baboons. Um, but probably my favorite and the most unexpected of the lot is the hippopotamus. Um, and in Luangwa, where this picture was taken, um, there is a population of 30,000 of these behemoths. And the Luangwa River, it's an arm of the Rift Valley and it flows through this through the Luangwa Valley, um, which is very exposed and towards going into October before the rains come, it gets very, very dry. And um, the river slowly dries up and then the hippos have to take refuge in lagoons, in wafwas, and there's, there's really no grass around. And for animals um, of three tons that need grass to survive, it becomes a problem. And so quite remarkably, the hippos have, have modified their behavior and they consume these um, sausage tree fruit because the sausage trees are very prolific in the Luangwa Valley. And this seems to sustain this enormous population of hippos through the dry season until the rains return. What it does also do, uh, funnily enough, just a, a quick um, remark is that it's quite amusing when you go there because you can literally be driving around in the heat of the day and there'll be a hippo standing in the shade of a sausage tree almost waiting to say like come on drop me a fruit because all of the ones under the trees have have inevitably been eaten up but the Luangwa Valley is wonderful for uh, hippo behavior um, because of the, the stress that the lack of water causes, there's always a lot of interaction taking place between these amazing animals. Um, all of this interaction tends to happen at opposite poles of the hippo's body. So in the front, you've, you've got these enormous um, canine teeth that they use for display. And then at the back there, you can see that tail that paddles to, to flick the dung everywhere. And, and that's all the territorial displays um, that go on at the opposite poles of a hippo's body. Um, and then this fighting can really um, deteriorate into very severe altercations, which then may see um, one or other of those bulls relegated to a drying up lagoon. Um, and the cycle of life then continues and closes um, for one creature, but obviously providing an, an enormous amount of nutrients then back into the system um, for the next wave, I suppose, of sausage trees to then grow. Scavenger that is worth noting at this point in the talk is a jackal. And this little guy, um, I'm sure you can guess where I'm going, um, is 
the reason that a jackalberry is named jackalberry, Diospyris muspiliformis. And these trees are incredible riverine trees as well. This picture does probably not do the tree justice, except that it was just such a beautiful color. Um, but they really get enormous. Those trees, when you're driving around the Kruger, that inevitably are arched right over the road, big shady uh, dark green canopies. Those are jackalberries. And these trees get their name from the fruit that grows on the tree. Diospyrus actually means pair of the gods. And jackals love these fruits. They can stay on the tree for up to a year before they ripen, but then eventually they'll fall onto the ground. And remarkably, many people don't know, but jackals are omnivores and they will utilize insects and rodents. Um, but if there's a, a good stash of fruit to be had, they will be in there in a flash. And so this tree um, earned its name from the jackals that eat its fruit. Um, they are not the only creatures, anything will eat um, jackalberry fruit when it's ripe in particular, uh, things like monkeys and baboons, baboons love um, jackalberry fruit, they love fruit generally, um, and it's one of the reasons that primates have color vision actually, is so that they are able to determine whether the fruit is ripe or not, because there's all kinds of alkaloids in green fruit. It's not to say that they don't sometimes eat some kinds of green fruit, but it was one of the evolutionary reasons that they developed um, color vision. Uh, also those forward facing eyes in baboons, very much an adaptation for being able to gauge depth and distance, which is super important when you are clambering around in a jackalberry tree. Um, and then of course the, the the primates also use color very much in their um, dominance displays and in their mating displays. So the female um, baboon will develop that scarlet skin around her rump, which will then be a visual cue to the baboon that she is ready to mate. But one thing that it does not furnish on these animals, sorry, there's a helicopter going over, the joys of Johannesburg. Um, the one thing it does not furnish on these creatures is good nighttime vision. So um, just as the, the jackalberry services these animals during the day because they can find food at night, um, it then provides a safe refuge for them to sleep because they do not see well and they are obviously then more vulnerable to predation. Um, and so often you will find baboons retreating into the boughs of a jackalberry just as the sun is going down um, or coming down from the boughs of a jackalberry first thing in the morning, enjoying a bit of breakfast on the way down um, before they head off for the day. That is what the fruits look like once they have ripened a little bit. And another animal that you will always find in close association with these trees is of course green pigeons for our bird lovers and purple crested terracos um, that just absolutely love these fruits. And as I mentioned, the fruit can be on the tree all year round. And so often they actually have almost permanent residence of these green pigeons living in the bars of the tree. Um, Humans also love the fruit. You can make jams and jellies or just eat them fresh um, and, and ports and that kind of thing from the fruits. And in many rural areas where sections of bush are cleared for um, crop cultivation, um, the uh, jackalberry trees are left standing because they are considered so valuable for this pair of the gods fruit. You can also see here the leaves, and this is a lovely tree to be able to identify from its leaves. It's very easy to identify from its leaves. Um, if we quickly go through that Samson formula, um, the, is it simple or compound? There is an example on that picture on the left of an axillary bud poking out the base of the leaf. So I know that that is a simple leaf. Um, the A for arrangement, these are quite obviously alternate. They alternate on the, the stem. They have a wavy margin. Uh, the size and shape is a medium sized leaf with a um, strap like shape. Um, o for, um, for texture and odor and other. The other in this case, I would say, is the fact that there's often red leaves amongst the, the green ones. When the leaves on this tree are new, they have a very red orange color. Um, and, and that is why the tree 
um, especially in spring, look so vibrant. Um, and then also when they lose their color, as you saw in that earlier picture, they also take on an orange um, effect. But if you can see a red leaf mixed in amongst the, the green ones, that usually infers that this is a jackalberry. And um, the N in this case um, is for nodes and glands and is not really relevant. But that's just a quick example of how you can work through Samson to determine the leaf structure of a plant, which in the case of a jackalberry isn't always useful unless it's a small one like that one on the right, because these trees obviously get so big, you would need binoculars to double check the leaf structure. But what does make it easy to identify is the bark. It's got this lovely dark black bark that's overwashed with little patches of white, um, which really stands out. It looks like a tree that's almost been burnt um, and charred, and then there's little bits of ash ash left on the surface. And that remarkably is actually one trunk that both of those, those branches just has um, diverted quite low down on the tree, which is also a common feature with jackalberries. But these enormous trees uh, traditionally were used for um, making makoros and the traditional dugout canoes that they use in the Okavango, uh, just because of those upright trunks um, and the, the, the solidity, but obviously uh, floatability of the wood. And this leads me to our next tree. Um, I hope I'm not talking too fast. I am watching the time here, um, but I do tend to say too much. So um, forgive me if I'm going a little quickly. Um, but this brings me to our next uh, tree, which is a leadwood. And this, of course, is not a tree that you want to be making a boat from. At 1.2 tons per cubic meter, um, it's denser than water, and leadwood is going straight to the bottom of the river. So I do not recommend making um, boats from this, but it does make uh, really good structural posts, or it did in, in the old days where you were allowed to use lead wood for things like that. Nowadays, the tree is protected, um, and hardwood in any event should never be removed from the bush, uh, because it does obviously uh, create micro habitats where a branch falls down and doesn't uh, degrade. Grass grows up around it and, and creates habitats for birds and for reptiles and, and small mammals. Um, but these trees, because they are so hard, uh, can stand for years even once they have died. Um, and some of these old um, trees have been carbon dated to hundreds of years old um, and, and still they will stand. Um, as you can see in this picture, that tree is not going to get its leaves ever again. Um, but this serves an, an important ecological purpose, which I will get to in a second. Um, the leadwood, just to mention, is a combretum imberbi. The wood is so hard that it is termite resistant, so it does not break down or it can't be broken down by termites the way other wood would be. Um, and it then serves a purpose for animals like vultures in particular. Because they've got such large wingspans, they need perches where they can sit um, and take off easily. Uh, first of all, by dropping off a branch uh, because they're heavy. So taking off upwards is a challenge, but to drop off a branch without becoming entangled in the foliage is a bonus. And so often when you find um, vultures roosting because the weather is overcast or um, you know, where they've gathered around a kill and there's a nice barren leadwood in the nearby proximity, they tend to, to gather on these trees. And sitting on these dead trees, kind of looking longingly at, at what awaits them is what has given them that reputation of being able to um, foresee the future and the reason that they are believed to be so powerful in the Muti world out there, uh, because they are believed by many people to be able to forecast the future. Um, but I doubt that they can do that. I, I think that they're just dreaming about their meal. And these birds are wonderfully adapted to for, for their job of cleaning up the bush. Um, and this picture depicts it so beautifully, those naked um, heads and necks 
to be able to stick them into carcasses without soiling their feathers too much. Um, but then that lovely feather scarf, that ruff around the neck that can be erected to warm the bird when it's cold or when it is flying high up in the sky. Um, very powerful bills um, and serrated tongues to get meat off bones. Um, and then flat feet, which you can't see in the picture, but that are a modification to being able to run in order to take off. And another reason that they are probably not the, the, the strongest perches and rely on trees like dead leadwoods um, for their ecological survival. The very hard wood of a leadwood obviously burns very solidly, which, um, which is great if, you, if you're stuck um, in a survival situation and you need some coals to burn all night. Um, but once again, not a good idea to collect it voluntarily these days because it's protected. But the, the, the ash of this tree um, is very abrasive and very white once it is burnt down. And this has led to it being used traditionally as a toothpaste, almost like mentored end granules uh, to whiten your teeth or when mixed with milk produces quite a nice whitewash um, for houses. This is a lovely tree like the jackalberry was to identify just purely based on bark, where the jackalberry is black and dark, the leadwood is very pale barked, um, and it's got this lovely patterning on it that looks like the scales on the back of a crocodile. And first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening, as the light is catching these trees along a river iron section, they just literally glow. You can just see the, ho the whole tree takes on this sort of pale gray white appearance. Um, and that gray is uh, reflected in its leaves and its fruit as well. So there's almost pixel-like spots on the leaf um, that when these are very new fresh leaves so they're quite green but as the leaves mature they take on a, a very gray look. So the overall impression, the jizz, the general impression of size and shape, um, the, the eye and fish um, tells you that this is a leadwood because it's got a very yellowish uh, grayish overall appearance. Um, the leaves have got these lovely wavy margins and then as I said these spots on the surface almost like the pixels on an out of focus photo or, or TV. Um, and when, when the tree is young it also develops spines um, which is a, a defense against herbivory. So the combination of um, those little spots on the leaves and then the spines, again the S in fish, um, is going to help you recognize this as a young leadwood tree. The pods are unique. All the Combretum family um, have these four winged pods um, and the seeds in the pod um, can give you quite chronic hic uh, hiccups. Um, so while uh, the pods on, on certainly the red bush willow and the russet bush willow are used to make teas, it's always recommended that you take that seed out in the middle. Um, but it does serve as a lovely um, favorite menu item, I suppose, for hornbills. They love these pods um, and they're, they're always on the tree in profusion. So when that is the case, um, another way of identifying this, this leadwood very easily, the small uh, yellow pods all over the tree. So the F in fish um, in that case, and also with those flowers that look like tiny miniature um, hedgehogs. That's a very distinct feature of the leadwood tree. Um, uh, sorry, not the leadwood tree, of the, the combretums in general, the four winged pods and the little hedgehog flowers. Um, number five would have to be the marula, the sclerocaria berea, another tree that really doesn't need much um, introduction. I think everybody knows about a marula, even if they don't know how to recognize a marula. And it's a lovely, easy tree just to distinguish purely based on its growth form. So in this case, um, an upright trunk with two to three main branches. And of course that configuration is just a perfect place for leopards to hang out. They love marula trees. They love the, the horizontal branches of marula trees. Um, and I always find it so interesting that they choose a marula so willingly to go and lie in because the upright trunk makes it uh, quite a challenge to get up. Um, and if any of you have ever tried to climb a marula, I think you will know what I'm talking about because they are, are quite difficult trees to climb um, 
important for us humans. Um, but also a lovely tree to recognize just simply based on the bark. Um, it looks like uh, Tiger Woods has been practicing his golf against the tree and sections of the wood pop off and reveal almost scoops, ice cream scoops or golf ball um, patterns in the bark with a, a white undertone. Um, the most famous part of the Marula tree, of course, is its fruit. Um, and these are on the tree in the months of February and March. And these fruits that are probably the size of a large plum or a very small peach um, have a very large pip inside them, very hard pip, and just a very thin layer of fruit around that pip. And it is, um, in spite of its size, 10 times richer in vitamin C than an orange. So they really are favored by everything that can get their hands on them. Uh, all the fruit eating um, usual suspects, the baboons and monkeys and fruit eating birds, and then animals like um, civets um, and, and elephants, of course, are well known for loving marula fruits um, and for the health benefits really that they give them. They, they've been doing studies to see whether, um, because in the summer, in February and March, you literally will find elephant bulls standing under these trees, devouring the fruit, whether there's some kind of relationship between boosting their immune systems with the vitamin C and then them coming into an extended period of must, which is the males um, breeding um, elevated testosterone um, condition where they will seek out females. And they, they've been doing studies to see if there's any correlation between the two. Um, we, of course, also, whoops, wrong way, um, absolutely love um, marulas, usually in the form of amarula. Um, and not only are the fruit and the, the, the pulp of the fruit um, delicious, but inside that hard, pip if you can get them open you can see there there's a nut which tastes very much like an almond which is very rich in oils it's very delicious and um, those oils are being extracted uh, nowadays for cosmetic products um, and it traditionally was used as a, a preservative on meat you could rub uh, marula oil onto meat um, and it would help to preserve it which maybe is why it's good for skin to preserve a old leather skin. <laughs> so the elephants, when they're not eating the fruit, obviously love to destroy the trees themselves. They um, uh, often have quite um, good water retention and sugar retention. So you get male and female trees. And, and I think if a, if a tree doesn't have fruit, an elephant won't think twice about pushing it over to chew on its roots. They also eat the bark. They will strip it off for the vascular tissue, which is the part of the plant that transfers the sugars and, and water um, and can create quite a lot of damage on marulas. But like baobabs, these trees are able to heal. Um, those wounds often form weak spots on the trunk that might get burnt out in a fire, and then a cavity will form, um, and then important habitats are established there for animals like squirrels or hole nesting birds. Um, and then the other animal that lives in association with this tree is, of course, the beautiful and enormous lunar moth, um, which can see, be seen sometimes where you have eruptions of these, these moths um, because the caterpillars feed on um, the leaves of the marula tree. Now I'm going to cheat and I know that I uh, need to leave some time for questions so I'm going to quickly just say um, that th this talk wouldn't be complete without the Nyala tree. It's just such a stalwart of the African bush, um, so beautiful and uh, no talk is complete without the Nyala tree but this is of course number six. So Xanthosus is Zambezi acre very quickly, just a massive massive tree often grows in these big dry areas and um, almost in a sense even though you get baobabs in these areas they, they take on almost like an, an island an ecosystem island value where you can get all kinds of creatures that utilize the bars of these trees um, for shade and for food. Um, and an easy tree to recognize purely because of the size, but also because of its very messy growth form. The, the branches, um, like the jackalberries sometimes do, branch very low. So although, let me quickly go back to this picture, you can see 
uh, three main stems there, that's actually all one tree and one trunk and they will be joined right at ground level. And in this case, you can see here how they've all branched from sort of a meter up and that's very characteristic of these enormous trees. They almost have a, a thick bottom and then the branches all choose their own direction. Um, and then the leaves typically grow directly out of the bark, which makes it very, very obvious. Um, uh, a bark that is yellow, pale yellow, and quite obvious, it pops off little sections, as you can see in the middle of this picture. It's missing a, a disc. Um, I won't go into leaf structures and that kind of thing, but just to say that these are legumes um, and unusual in that they don't have pods like the acacias or the vichelias. Um, they've got these little berry fruits and these fall to the ground. And this is what um, the nyalas love to eat and how the tree um, developed its name, much like the jackal and the jackalberry. Um, often um, nyalas live in abundance in the same riverine habitats in the same areas that these trees produce. Um, and are big fans of those fruit. Um, but, but the tree being a legume will have rhizobium in the soil, which is a nitrogen fixing bacteria. So they create um, islands of um, fertility um, and sometimes otherwise very um, unfertile environments. And they're also phreatophytes. So their root systems go all the way down to water tables. Um, and so you know that where Nyala trees are growing, also called Mashatu trees in Botswana, um, that there will be groundwater in the area. A tree that elephants absolutely love as well. So that brings us to the end of, of the big six, not the big five. And I hope that you have all learned something and enjoyed learning something um, from, from my adventures in the bush and my passion for the bush and that trees will leave their mark in some way on you and that you next time visit the bush fault are able to go and um, yeah, just, just find a different layer, find a, a deeper meaning in your experience because maybe you're a little bit more aware of those guys, those, those sort of supporting actors at the back of your stories. And so I guess I, I would just like to leave you with the thought that if trees could talk, perhaps they would say to you, learn a little bit more, learn a little bit more about me, learn a little bit more about my friends, all the different species out there, uh, learn to care a little bit more because as our curiosity grows and our knowledge grows um, about something, we will all care a little bit more about the systems in which these beautiful things grow. Thank you. Thank you, John. I think you're on mute, yeah. Wow, wow, wow. I think um, that's where I need to start. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, these talks are proudly <laughs> brought to you by Room to Grow Landscaping, Straight Nature, and Kirsten Bosch National Botanical Garden. It's been an absolute pleasure, Megan, to have you here with us. You've been amazing. and. Um, to all our participants today that have joined us today, uh, I said at the beginning of the talk that you've got a wonderful surprise for you at the end. And this surprise is right in front of you. Um, today, we are offering a special discount to all you attendees. Uh, the offer will be on for the next week. Um, for 100 bush felt trees, you need to get this book. I think, um, Megan, you've described it so beautifully. and. Um, You've just made all of us want to go back to our childhood and just go and start climbing trees now. Um, you've, you've said so many things about trees that, you know, and, and the stories behind the trees have just been so amazing. So thank you very much. Thank you for your passion. And uh, we can feel it come across. It's almost like when you're talking, we could touch you and, and, and feel you. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> I, I, I have to say, before I take a couple of questions, I have to say, I absolutely love um, the last tree, um, the Nyala tree, I, I, I just, with a type of jumping that you're doing, you absolutely <laughs> don't need the gym. <laughs> so Megan, we've got a couple of questions. Um, uh, let me just read all of them out quickly because of literally it's just a couple and others are just beautiful comments that we've received from our participants. Um, the first one uh, from Anonymous says, how many young babbles, um, babbles uh, have you seen and where? Uh, second one from Janine, curious about 
any new baobab conservation efforts. Uh, I understand um, there aren't many young ones making it to adulthood. Um, do you know of any conservations that's happening around that? Um, Sherry says, hey, Megan, how do these big bush fell trees fare out in the habitat? E.G. Kistenbosch National Botanical Gardens, um, do you know how they fare out? Um, Janine also saying, um, oh, I think it's Charlotte. Charlotte saying, hello, um, have, you look, have you looked at all um, at the way trees communicate with one another um, via rhizomes? I'm, I'm hoping I'm saying that. Just hit us with those uh, a few questions quickly and then, um, yeah, as we winding up to the end. Okay, perfect. So the baobabs, um, yes, I, I hear it's a good question. Actually, you don't see a lot of, of baobab recruitment, so a lot of, of saplings, um, but you do see some, and, and I mentioned the Makuleki area, the Pafiri area of, of the Kruger Park, and certainly I've seen young baobabs there. <clears throat> Um, and we, we actually in the lodge that I used to work at, there was one in the garden um, and it had been planted there. So obviously we, we could watch it was still quite small. So it was quite interesting to then go and examine the leaf structures. Uh, that's where I first learned about that. But, but agreed, these trees don't recruit um, terribly well. And I don't think that they know why. I do know that there is a fungus that's actually affecting the trees. Um, and then in, in some areas, obviously, where, where there's overpopulations of elephants, they, they have wondered if, if there's a correlation there with the elephants destroying the trees. Um, in terms of, of conservation efforts around them, I do think that mm -hmm. there are, I heard of something through, I think it's through Vitz, where they were looking into the, the, the funguses. Um, but I, I mean, I would have to, I don't know off the top of my hat about the conservation efforts around baobabs, um, but certainly whoever made that comment about the recruitment is, is correct. I have seen sapling, mm. but, um, but it's, it's, they're, they're not very common. common. Um, with regards to the uh, the how the big trees fare out there and um, it, it the bush is about cycles. We, we all like to think that, you know, everything will get to like this beautiful equilibrium and then it'll stay like that. And I mean, if we've been around long enough to have seen the, the floods that came through Kruger in, in 2013, there were floods in Kruger in 2000, bad floods, and there've been some smaller ones in between those. And you just have to look at the Olifants River and how that entire river was completely scoured of trees and has been completely mm -hmm changed um, from the, the beautiful river run system that it used to be. And it doesn't seem, having visited recently, like there's a huge amount of recruitment going on there either with the tree species. So the, the whole system has changed. Um, but in some areas, take for example the Timbavati River, they are massive trees and, and around Shingwetsi those, those river run trees are, are very much intact and, and you know, doing fine. So I suppose it all depends on the level of protection from people in and around these protected areas, outside of protected areas. I think sometimes they get poached for the, the wood and that kind of thing. Um, but, but certainly there are still some magnificent trees out there. I mean, if you pop into the Tule Park in Botswana as well, along those river iron areas, there's, there's amazing trees. I hope I'm, I'm answering that question correctly, if I've, I've understood the, the question. But, no, but that's nature for you, nature, you know, in terms of droughts and storms and that kind of thing, floods, it's going, going to adjust the ecosystem. Um, and, and that's awesome. the dynamics are very important for mm. ecosystems. Maybe quickly take us through, um, um, have you looked at the, the way trees communicate with one another? <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear that, that one. Guess, it's always a question I get because of the, the, the name of the topic. And um, what, what they definitely do commu communicate in the sense of the vitilias, the acacias that um, produce tannins um, when they are being particularly heavily brassed by things like giraffe. Uh, tannins are chemicals that make protein unavailable to animals. And they, they start when the, the tree senses that it's losing too much foliage, it'll start to release the tannin uh, to make it um, unpalatable 
palatable to the giraffe. And you can actually watch as they're feeding, suddenly they'll retract their heads. Um, and then you, you, you become aware of the fact that, okay, hang on, those leaves are not tasting so good anymore. And if um, yeah. the wind is blowing or a slight breeze is blowing, a, a tree in the nearby vicinity can actually detect those tannin, increased tannin levels and then we'll start producing tannins and soils. So that is why often giraffe will feed upwind um, so that they're feeding away from any of those secret smoke signals that they're sending one another to say, hey guys, watch out, the giraffe are coming. Um, aside from that, uh, and the, the whispers that they make in the wind, I don't know how trees communicate with one another. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm gonna just take one more question and then let's wrap it up. Um, um, and this particular question um, seems to be quite technical from Mr. Warren. I hope it's Mr. Warren Pearson. He says, would the lack of saplings be a direct result of elephants, uh, elephant numbers? Not necessarily, not necessarily. Yeah. So, so it could be for any number of reason, reasons, it could just be the seeds there, there could be something that needs to happen for the seeds to recruit into seedlings or um, habitat conditions or events. Sometimes, um, you know, fever trees are another one where they don't necessarily find um, the, the seedlings recruiting into bigger trees. Um, and it's almost like they need some kind of event to happen, a flood or a change in the soil or some kind of cue before they then suddenly start to to grow. So I don't know what those things are for baobabs, and I'm, I'm not even convinced that um, the, the scientists know. Um, so it's, it's all part of the mystery of trying to understand these trees. It's a good thing, I suppose, while we're trying to work out why they don't have babies, or why the babies don't do so well, that they then last for hundreds of years in the meantime. But certainly that people are very worried about baobabs and them disappearing out of, out of our systems. So let's hope they figure it out. Yeah, um, I have to apologize for taking this last one because of this is one of the first few questions that came in a little That's bit earlier on. Um, um, it's, it's, it's an absolute last one, ladies and gentlemen, and there's quite a lot more coming. Um, so what we'll do is we'll collate all the questions um, and we'll compile them and we'll just um, return them to, to all the, the members that have joined us this morning. Um, so this last question says, um, it's from Miss Wei Jones, uh, says, I have lost quite a few trees, uh, maple, avocado, um, sclerophyra, uh, through drought and short hole burrow. Uh, are drought conditions aiding to this burrow problem? Sure. I have to confess, I don't know. I am, um, I... Yeah. Well, I'll let you all in on a secret. I absolutely love trees to death, but that's the problem is if I try and grow them myself, I kill them. <laughs> I do not have green fingers. So, um, so, so from a gardening point of view, I'm a very enthusiastic gardener, but not a very good one. And um, I, I do not understand the ins and outs of, and, and certainly for whoever's asked this question, um, it, it would also depend where they are in the climate and, and other conditions. So I really can't give any kind of straight answer on that, sorry. Megan, I think that was very clear. I think that's that's beautiful. Thank you for your, for your passion. Thank you for your love. Thank you for the work that you do. Um, thank you for bringing the world of trees live. I think you. I think that I love the intricate stories that you tell between um, the five top trees. In fact, the top six trees that you that you uh, presented us to to us this morning. The the little stories they make for such a nice sit around the table and you know adventure telling stories. Um, it makes us want to go out, take our little ones outside, you know, our grandchildren outside to actually just play and enjoy nature. And it also tells us how brave you are because of if trees could tell, uh, could say something, it would say there's so much danger there, but you just go in the face of danger because of your passion. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you absolutely for that. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, once more, uh, this uh, presentation was brought to you by Room to Grow Landscape, uh, Straight Nature and Kirsten Bosch. Um, our next talk, which will be the last one, will be uh, on the 2nd of December, and it will be by uh, Professor Peter Ryan, if I'm not mistaken, and that will be on birds. Uh, I think uh, we've got a beautiful um, uh, 
uh, summer season coming up. So there'll be lots of birds singing. So that's going to be um, a very nice talk to look forward to. Uh, but for today, ladies and gentlemen, remember that you've got um, you still have a chance of getting this uh, awesome discount. Uh, the book is available at the Kistenbosch Bookshop, 100 Bushfell Trees. Make sure you go and get it. Uh, I think this is going to make a beautiful, wonderful Christmas present to someone and a little beautiful coffee table uh, book to have as well. So Megan, thank you so much for the work that you do. And uh, we look forward to um, uh, connecting with you again soon. Um, and uh, that's about Thank that. you for having me. It's been lovely. Absolute pleasure. I feel privileged to have be been able to speak to fellow tree lovers. So thank you. <laughs> awesome stuff. You are surrounded by enthusiasts here. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. We will see you guys on the 2nd of December when we um, run our last talk. To Kathy, um, uh, to the whole team, Belinda, uh, doing all the background work. Thank you, thank you very much for putting this wonderful talks together. And um, without the whole team, this wouldn't be possible. And thanks again for connecting with all of us, ladies and gentlemen. Until we meet again, see you on the other side. Thank you very much. Megan, have a good one. And you. Goodbye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.